Superhero games have this predilection for sucking. Making a superhero game, especially a licensed one, has been a fool's errand for decades. Countless failures, dozens of mediocre Marvel games that range from Deadpool to Wolverine that followed a suite of atrocious attempts at making Superman work in a gaming context in the 64-bit era. Superheroes and gaming have not been a good match. Sure, every once in a while you'll get your Spider-Man 2s, your above-average Activision release, but for the most part, everyone's favorite Crime Stoppers have been limited to 2D fighting games and mobile experiences. Except for Batman. The Arkham Trilogy is one of the greatest trilogies that gaming has seen over the past two decades, superhero or otherwise. What Rocksteady created across three releases was an astonishing work of storytelling, world building, and gameplay, in a way that revolutionized the licensed subgenre much in the way Christopher Nolan's Dark Knight Trilogy did for film. But I keep seeing a common thread of logic across forums and blogs when people ask for another release from Rocksteady. The games didn't do anything interesting, they're just good superhero games. If it wasn't Batman, they wouldn't care. Well, let's unpack this statement. Today I'll only be talking about Rocksteady's Arkham Trilogy. I'm not talking about Arkham Origins simply for the fact that they're made by a different developer. Game is still great, it's just not what we're discussing today. But I don't have enough cash! We'll work something out. Wink wink. Oops, that belongs in a different folder. Oops. Rocksteady is one of the most unlikely development heroes of the past generation. Their name is spoken ubiquitously now as one of the best developers in gaming. But before Arkham Asylum, no one even knew they existed. That's because the studio was founded just five years before Asylum would launch, and they made a single game in that time. You probably haven't heard of it, Urban Chaos Riot Response. It's a game with a terrible name, and a game that today would probably never come out, let alone even begin development. It's a shooter where you play the role of a cop, mowing down violent protesters with all manner of weaponry. 2006 was clearly a different time. Seeing the game today, its tone is extremely dark, its violence is ridiculous. It was made and released in a political climate in which no one batted an eye. This is partially because no one played it. The game wasn't very good, it received middling scores from critics ranging from 4.5s to 7s, and failed to catch on at retail. This was Rocksteady's only game before Eidos approached them to make a pitch for Batman. A strange choice, sure, but the pitch went well. Soon, development was full underway on their second game, with people like Paul Dini, writer of Batman the Animated Series, joining the dev team as they set out to make a game with one goal in mind. Redefine Batman for gaming, both narratively and in a gameplay capacity. With this philosophy, the game and its story were developed concurrently with one another, as opposed to the normal process of story development being finished before gameplay development gets fully underway. With 60 team members and 21 months of time, that's it. Just over a year and a half, their attempt at bringing a comic book to life in Arkham Asylum was completed. There was no massive hype train, gamers expected what they always expect with a licensed product. Mediocrity. Arkham Asylum released to a trepidatious audience with lowered expectations. And then something happened. It changed gaming. And the first way they did that was with how they approached Batman himself. You can't expect to hire 60 workers to dig a cave under your house and then keep it a secret. They built a lazy Susan for your nuclear car. That's something they consider conversation worthy. Which version of Batman is your favorite? Is it Christopher Nolan's take? Is it Adam West? Maybe it's the animated Batman Beyond's version of the Cape Crusader. Everyone has their favorite version of their favorite superhero. This is the first problem with gaming's approach to these kind of games. They're always attempting to replicate one version of these heroes. Sometimes it's because they're tie-ins with a movie. Other times it's simply because that's what DC or Marvel want, but it almost never works out. Why? Because gaming is a wholly unique medium that requires an incredibly different approach to character and story than a two-hour movie or 30-minute TV episode. So Rocksteady did the right thing. They said, f*** it. Let's make our own Batman. The Batman they created is a Batman that rides a fine line between comic book Batman and Dark Knight Batman, and it works painfully well. Arkham Asylum and Arkham Knight share one thing in common that Rocksteady does spectacularly. Those two games are more of an exploration of Batman's psyche than they are a quest to stop a threat against Gotham City. Asylum takes place entirely within the gates of, well, Arkham Asylum. This is not a coincidence. You spend the game surrounded by insanity, so much so that it begins to weigh on the actual player. The ambiance of chaos can be haunting, and then you hit the Scarecrow sequences, and you take a literal look at the fear that drives this Batman. The manifestation of the skeletons in his closet, a living version of his nightmares, it is dark as hell. But it's not dark simply for the sake of edginess. It's the grim reality of being a hero in this environment. And we will get back to those sequences. But Rocksteady's utilization of insanity within their version of Batman and his universe is wrapped up immaculately in Arkham Knight. You spend that game trying to stop fear from literally taking over the city, but more so, 
from taking over Batman. I won't entirely spoil the role of the Joker in that game, but more than anything, you are haunted by this figure, this manifestation of insanity, of chaos, at every turn throughout that experience. In Arkham Knight, the Joker comes to Batman through vision-like sequences at almost every turn, after every battle, after every shift in the story, and acts as the narrative voice of Batman's own slipping grip on reality, his fragile mental state. Rocksteady dared to make a game about a broken, Batman, and they turned that game into a trilogy that is as much about Batman's own insanity as it is the line he straddles between ruthless criminal and bringer of justice, and they examine what this really does to someone that has to live it every day. They dared to make a grim game, a grim trilogy about a hero that at one point was played by an overzealous, overweight actor on TV. They dared to challenge what a superhero game could be in the medium from a narrative perspective, and they did it by making Batman their own. And this continued into the gameplay. Just know that I don't give a f JK, I give so many f inside that bag are all the f I give. It's empty. Here's a problem every Superman game has suffered from greatly. Every Iron Man game, every Wolverine game. How do you make playing as a nearly invulnerable character fun without removing all of the challenge or changing everything that defines that character? This is the hardest part of making a superhero game, forcing vulnerability on larger than life characters. Rocksteady had to walk a fine line between allowing the player to feel like Batman without making the game too easy. As Christopher Williams noted, Batman is a character unwilling to kill while also having a brutally finite amount of health himself. And in the comics, this makes for interesting stories, but in games, it translates into a compulsive balancing mechanic that also shows Batman in a new light. Rocksteady nailed it. The action in the Arkham Trilogy is brutal, but it's fair. You have so many tools at your disposal in a fight, so many combo opportunities that you never feel at a disadvantage. But you can also never underestimate the people and the enemies in front of you. The combo-based brawling in these games appears on the surface to be nothing but unsubstantiated spectacle, but it's anything but that. It is a deep system that requires timing, skill, and it's a system that offers player growth. You can be terrible, and you can get better. That's the mark of a good combat system. The way you control Batman 15 hours in is markedly different and more complex than the way you did 13 hours ago. The ability to go from sweeping your body over one thug to tossing a batarang before moving directly into a counter is video game brawling at its most visually and mechanically poetic. This is because this version of Batman Batman can and will die. You cannot hop into a crowd of gun-toting enemies and button mash your way to victory in the later stages of these games, or even some of the early stages. Over the course of three outings, this combat system evolved. The enemies did as well. Each enemy has their own vulnerabilities, their own strengths that ensure that your 100th encounter is just as interesting as your 10th. This ability to slowly and organically evolve the challenges thrown at you is a mark of good game design, and the game teaches you this by letting these enemies brutally destroy Batman. Again, he's vulnerable, and when you slip up, the game makes you pay and you must learn, the player must evolve. This is only possible by nailing the line between vulnerability and superhero, and it comes into play with the next thing that makes these games so special. And Poison Lenny! Yeah. <laughs> no snake tattoo. When will I find the man who murdered my parents? Set pieces are what define some of gaming's biggest franchises. Call of Duty, Uncharted, Tomb Raider. Set pieces are also one of the defining elements of the Arkham Trilogy. And damn, are they good. Set pieces in the Arkham Trilogy often take the form of boss fights, and depending on how pedantic you want to get about defining the term set piece, you may view some of this section as an overglorification of an archaic gaming template. But boss fights, set piece, whatever you call it, the Arkham Trilogy does so many so well. There are too many set pieces and boss fights in gaming that devolve into QTEs, or mechanically simplistic bouts of bullet sponge tedium. Then there's moments like the Mr. Freeze fight in Arkham City that give you all your tools and say, figure it out. And they force you to think about your environment and your tool set in ways that you previously hadn't considered without taking agency or control away from the player. The Mr. Freeze fight is an incredible battle in every way imaginable. Two unbelievable geniuses with advanced technology playing a game of chess between lethality and morality. The fight is intense and most importantly, you're in full control of Batman throughout the whole experience. Mr. Freeze in this fight has an AI that is so smartly programmed to perfectly counter many of your attempts at head-on brutality that in turn leave you with a living puzzle in a frozen lab. Instead of turning into some Nathan Drake, train hopping, turn your brain off superhero, you are placed in front of a challenge that is in so many ways your equal. And again, told to figure it out. Once you use one tool or takedown, 
Freeze learns them and you can't use them again, and this forces you to play out of your element and use everything you have at your disposal. This brings us right back to Scarecrow's nightmare experiences in Asylum. There are three in the base game of Asylum and one DLC one, and they all do two things very well. They serve a narrative purpose that we already touched on, but they also provide unique gameplay experiences in the pseudo-platforming sections they offer. But more importantly, they are a unique visual experience. They are haunting just to look at, and this makes these moments truly feel as though you're playing through the pages of a comic book. Hell, the opening first person sequence of Arkham Knight is so powerful. It puts the players in the shoes of a normal human being and allows you to live through the reality of the game's threat firsthand as a vulnerable victim. This kind of set piece weighs on you, on the threat you're trying to stop throughout the rest of the game and makes it feel all the more real. And there are so many more of these moments littered throughout these three games, and many of them, like the freeze fight, only work because Rocksteady perfected the next and maybe most important gameplay element within the trilogy. Jesus is okay with it, but we can't tell Dad. <laughs> Not that secret, the other secret. I'm Batman! Yeah, I'm a show man. One thing people don't often consider when discussing the Rocksteady trilogy is that these games are stealth games. You engage in your fair share of brutal action, sure, but Batman's number one tool is his ability to go unnoticed. And again, Rocksteady nailed it. As already discussed, the bat in these games is vulnerable. You enter a room with 15 thugs and expose yourself too early, you're going to be plugged full of bullets and sent back to the checkpoint. But Rocksteady also made sure that you understand what you're getting yourself into. They managed to contain and maintain the stealth sections of these games in ways that make them act as though they're almost puzzled. Then they made sure they were fun to solve. Too many times in gaming we see quote unquote stealth sections of games marginalized to turning off your brain, pressing B to crouch, and slowly walking up behind poorly programmed AI one after another and taking them out as all their buddies watch and don't react. There is none of that here. Each room, each stealth section is built like an immaculately designed puzzle that requires you to be engaged with what's happening on screen at all times. They require thought, planning, and execution in the ways a good stealth game should. And the beauty is, you're given all the tools you need to be as creative and inventive as you please in solving them. But this next reality is vital. The AI responds appropriately. That is a part of what makes Arkham Stealth so special. As you whittle down the numbers, as you pick your enemies off one by one, your enemies will take notice and they will begin to panic in meaningful ways that change your approach to the situation. They may go hunting for you in a place you didn't expect, forcing you to change position. They'll begin firing into thin air. It's haunting. The fear you as Batman are creating is tangible and makes you feel like you really are the Bat. And what that AI behavior does in combination with the phenomenal level design is ensure that you're challenged while still feeling like a terrifying vigilante. And that there is the running theme of this trilogy. Game design that makes you feel powerful, that makes you feel like Batman without taking away your tools or arbitrarily weakening you and without allowing you to breeze your way through the games unscathed. That is easier said than done, especially with stealth. Stealth and superhero is not a mix that always makes sense in gaming, but through clever game design, through clever level design, and through strong mechanics, Rocksteady makes it work. What Rocksteady has accomplished with their Arkham games is nothing short of greatness. They have earned their stellar reputation as both storytellers and game makers. That's what makes this medium so unique, so special. The ability to tell the stories that you get out of film and television and comics while allowing you to experience and interact with them firsthand. The Arkham Trilogy is some of the greatest Batman experiences available. Literature, comics, film, TV, it stands side by side with these other mediums and does so confidently. But the trilogy's legacy lies solely in gaming and it's what these games can do for this subject. Genre. There are no more excuses. Licensed superhero games, even licensed games in general, can be great, can sell in today's gaming climate. We know that now. It shows other studios that this is a standard that gamers now expect you to meet when you dive head on into your next Avengers game or Iron Man game. It's to show Eidos what can be done when they are tasked with making their next Marvel game. Show Insomniac the type of original tale that can be crafted when you haven't maintained the right talent. These games are the new gold standard for superhero games. It really is mind boggling that a studio with no experience with this IP held barely any experience making a game has managed to create these three pieces of near comic book perfection. Rocksteady had no business being called a crate development studio in 2007. A decade later, they don't deserve to be called anything but that. Thank you for giving gamers a Batman worth being proud of. Well guys, that is it for today's video, and as always, I want to know what you guys think. What is your favorite superhero game of all time? It can be Spider-Man, Batman, Wolverine, does not matter. And then, to synthesize it down even further, what is your favorite Batman game?
Is it Arkham Knight? Is it Arkham Origins? Is it Arkham Asylum? Let me know the answers to any of those questions down in the comments below. I think it's really interesting looking at these games individually. There is a huge difference between Arkham Asylum and Arkham Knight. And you can see Arkham City as this bridge in this trilogy that I think is really special and really unique and shows real growth between the three games, even if not all of it hits the mark like the Batmobile in Arkham Knight. Anyways, if you enjoyed the video, press that like button down below. If you haven't yet done so, press subscribe. I put out more content each and every week, so if you press subscribe, you won't miss any of that. Also, next to the subscribe button, you guys will hear this from me every video. There is a little bell. That little bell is great. All that little bell does is make sure you're actually notified when I upload a video. So if you press that little bell next to the subscribe button, you will actually, well, again, be notified when things go up on this channel. So press subscribe and the little bell. And until next time, guys, I am out.